I'm Chance. And I'm Sarah Catherine. And this is Conservation Connection. Presented by Last Chance Endeavors. We're a husband and wife team running a wildlife education nonprofit. It's focused on connecting students to their environment. Each week, here on Conservation Connection, we do just that by introducing you to the groundbreaking science and conservation work that's happening every day across the globe. We talk to professionals in the world of conservation science and wildlife management and ask them about their career, their current projects, their wild and crazy stories from the field, and everything in between. This episode is part of our very first mini-series. Over four weekends, we're highlighting the research experience for undergraduates program that happens every summer at the Fort Johnson campus in Charleston. Listen in to hear the stories of 10 undergraduate researchers as they learn what it's really like to be part of real world science. Let's get to the show. Alrighty guys, welcome to another episode of Conservation Connection. This is another episode in our Fort Johnson REU mini series. We're really excited. We're sitting across the table from Presley, Jordan, Anna, and Lilia. Welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We're really glad to have you guys here. Um, so let's just go around so that everybody listening can figure out who is who. And if you can just tell me your name, where do you go to school, and what year you're going to be. My name is Presley Wilson. I go to USC Aiken, and I'm going into my senior year. My name is Jordan Penn. I go to Millersville University, and I'm going to be a senior. My name is Anna Silverio. I go to UT Austin, and I'm going to be a senior. My name is Lilia Garcia. I go to Illinois Wesleyan University, and I'm going to be a junior. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate you guys taking time out of your weekend to record this episode with us. We definitely want to start by just hearing a little bit more about everyone's project. So why don't we start with you? So I am here to study Gracilaria, which is um, an invasive red seaweed. What I'm looking at is how it affects the microbiome in the estuaries here. Uh, bacteria makes up a huge part of our ecosystem, so the more we understand how it interacts with this invasive red seaweed, the more we know about the estuary itself. When you say microbiome, you're talking about literally the bacteria that lives on the outside of the algae, right? Yeah. So immediately outside of the algae, on the algae, just anywhere around it. Because when we hear that term, a lot of times you hear like your gut microbiome, like the all the bacteria that live inside your intestines and help you digest food and, and do that. So it's really interesting to hear people that are studying the bacteria on the outside of organisms and how important that can be for the environment in general. Yeah. So a lot of plants are able to control what the bacteria that lives around it is. So we want to see if that's the case with these uh, water plants. Cool. Okay. Now, who else is studying Gracilaria as well? I am. You are. Okay. Yes. So tell me a little bit about what you're doing. So on the same wavelength, um, I'm also looking at Gracilaria, which is the invasive seaweed that we talked about before. But I'm looking at its interaction with uh, the fish population and looking at the biodiversity in the estuary and how that's been affected by it. Okay. So how it's interacting with like juvenile fish, adult fish? A juvenile fish. So estuaries are a really big nursery ground. And so it's very important for the early stages of their life. Cool. Jordan, you kind of have one of the um, less connective uh, research topics with this specific group, but still a really cool topic. Tell us some about yours. Okay. I'm looking at ROV footage, which is like an underwater robot that can be manned from a boat. ROV footage from the seafloor counting deep sea and cold water corals off the coast of California. Okay. So I guess you're not manning this ROV yourself. No, I'm just counting the corals. Okay, so where do you get this footage? Um, we get it from a research cruise that was taken a couple years ago. So I just watch the footage, count the corals, and describe whether they were found on hard uh, substrate like rocks or soft substrate like sand. Okay. And then getting back a little bit more to algae and microbiomes, Presley, can you tell me a little bit more about what you're doing? Sure. So I'm analyzing the diversity between algae microbiome, between the red, green, and brown algae off the coast of Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, we want to see how the bacteria compares between the algae species and also algae's uh, morphological features. So is there a difference between species and is there a difference because of how they look? So like physically ones with long strands versus ones that are more like puffballs versus ones, you know, physically the shape of the algae as it grows, does that change what bacteria you find on it, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. 
And we actually spoke a little bit with your mentor in our episode introducing this series, and she was really excited to be working with you and told us a little bit about how y'all are collecting your samples and that you actually have another scientist that went out there and sent them back to you, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's Dr. Heather Spaulding. Um, I'm working with Dr. Heather Fullerton, but Dr. Heather Spaulding will be going out again at the end of August to collect samples from the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, and she'll be studying how algae spatial patterns affect the microbiome as well. Awesome. Obviously, end of August, you're probably not going to be here anymore. Do you think you're going to try to kind of stay involved with the research at all? Or once you kind of finish up the summer, will you move on to like bigger, better other things? I would love to be involved in August, but unfortunately, I do have to go and finish my degree. (laughs) But there has been some talk of a possible master's program. So it would be a really cool master's topic. Good for you. That's awesome. Thank you. (laughs) That's one of the really important things about having opportunities like this REU program is that you're getting to network. You're getting to meet professors at different institutions that if something clicks and your research really aligns, it's like a ready built mentor for a graduate program. That's really awesome. Yeah. Anna and Lilia, I'd love to hear a little more from both of you. Do y'all's topics relate, besides obviously both of you are studying Grasselaria, but beyond that, do y'all see a lot of similarities in what y'all are studying? Do y'all ever go out in the field like at the same time? Or is it pretty <laughs> much just two separate things? Um, well, I have noticed that sometimes we do go out in the field at the same time, but I know Lilia is on a different part of the beach, a different part of the harbor that we're at, so we hardly see each other, but we do both rely on like the tide working with us and the weather and all sorts of things like that. It's really interesting for me to do it because, so Anna's marine bio. Yeah. I am <laughs> just general bio, and I go, to a, I go to a school in central Illinois, so I never like even had a tide chart on my phone before in front of me. (laughs) Um, So now I have the app and I check it all the time, but it was definitely like something that has been very far removed from me, like doing field work. But I actually learned a lot about like estuaries being nursing, nursery grounds and like Grasselaria being this place for these baby fish, basically. (laughs) Yeah, I learned a lot about that. I learned a lot about that when I first came here um, and talked to my mentor for the, for like the first day of the program. He told me a lot about that. That's mostly what I learned, that background. Um, so it's actually really cool when she came in and she told me what she was doing. And I said, oh, I know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice having the, like that connection. Like, oh, you know, like it's an invasive species, but we don't really know like what it was before. So we can't really compare if it's doing good or bad because we don't have a baseline. But yeah. it's nice having like someone that kind of knows what you're doing, too, in the program. It's a good support system, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool. She like works on way bigger organisms than I do. And she works on baby fish. <laughs> like, you know, like they're tiny. Yeah. But compared to what I'm doing, they're huge. Yeah. Right, right. Now, is there a specific set of bacteria you're looking at or a a certain species of bacteria? Yeah, so I am looking at a group of bacteria called Vibrio. I have not found a lot of literature about them, especially not when it comes to Gracilaria and their relationship with Gracilaria. But Vibrio is this pretty big group of bacteria, and they have a bunch of different strains or like species is what you would consider. A few of those strains are pathogenic to us, so they cause human illness. And so that is a big concern that we are looking at when it comes to studying this Gracilaria and its effect on Vibrio is, is it causing there to be growth of certain strains that may be pathogenic to humans that may cause problems in humans? Or is it inhibiting the growth, stopping the growth of these harmful strains? So there's the possibility that this invasive species of seaweed that, where did it originate? Where did it come from originally? Asia. So it's an Asian species of Mm -hmm. seaweed that's now established on the American East Coast. There's a possibility that that seaweed is also bringing with it pathogenic bacteria, bacteria that can make humans sick. And so you have this this kind of the seaweed is breaking down the front gates and then giving open entry to this bacteria that could be causing real problems for humans. Yeah. And it's really interesting. Not a lot of research has gone into this. We think about invasive species and their big effects on like large organisms, organisms we can see. Yeah, like lionfish. Yeah, like lionfish, right? Um, Gracilaria, I mean, it's just like, it's just a plant, you know? (laughs) So you, so, and especially if you're looking at bacteria, you can't see it. So it's hard to really think about the bacteria. And it's cool. My research is like one of the few studies that are looking at the bacterial effects. But that means that I'm going into a project that doesn't have much background in it. So 
it's cool, but it's also really hard at the same time. It's been it's been a little bit stressful um, and trying to figure out like what's the best approach to different, you know, different experiments. How do I change my approach to things? But it's been really cool. And I am really thankful that I have micro bio background already, because if I didn't have that, oh, man, I don't know how this would have gone. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny the skills that you realize you really need and you're really grateful, even though you're already like well past the stage where you needed to collect those skills. Yeah. 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 So I want to change gears a little bit here and talk about coral, which, you know, is very different from algae, but is still a really important builder of like habitats underwater. It's one of those foundational ecosystems. So when we think coral, a lot of times we're thinking like warm, tropical, clear waters that are up near the surface that I can go scuba diving and see pretty fish. And that's not the kind of coral that you're looking at, right, Jordan? Right. So tell me a little bit about kind of the ecosystem that you're working with. So, yeah, you're right. When people think about coral, they think about like the Great Barrier Reef and really pretty fish and something that you might want to actually look at. (laughs) (laughs) But um, I'm looking at corals between 70 and 300 meters, which is about up to a thousand feet. So that's pretty deep. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> the fish aren't so pretty. The corals that I'm looking at are kind of beautiful, but um, sometimes pretty sparse. So I'm looking at coral gardens, which are dense aggregations or like groupings, dense groupings of corals and trying to figure out sort of where they are most likely to be found so that we can protect those areas to protect their productivity. So you're doing, you know, there's there's kind of like really heavily applied science and then there's basic science. And the basic science is what happens when you're just trying to understand what's going on. So the basic science that you're doing is just like trying to figure out where these deep sea corals exist so that we can have some sense of how to protect them, right? Right. So that's really important to note that we kind of feel like we're in the information age and, you know, we know everything about everything. And there's still like huge, especially in the ocean, huge portions that we have no idea, even the basic, like we may have sampled less than 1% of the areas that this ecosystem might exist. And just looking at this footage and putting in, I'm sure, hundreds of hours <laughs> going through ROV footage and, and classifying this is here, this is not here, and, and getting a basic understanding, that's really critical to the machine of science. Yeah, the deep sea is largely unexplored. It covers most of the planet and it accounts for most of the ocean. So obviously it's something that has been a bit of a rising prospect as far as fishing goes as we start to deplete uh, fishing stocks near the coasts. So we're trying to protect those habitats from bottom trawling, which is really degrading to the bottom and which would take away from the biodiversity of the coral gardens. And have you had any surprises along the way since you've been studying this, things that you've come across that you didn't expect to see? Um, I mean, as far as animals go, <laughs> it's been pretty interesting. I see like octopuses sometimes, um, chimeras, which were thought to be extinct until a couple of years ago, um, six scale sharks. Whoa, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, chimeras are really cool, but six scale sharks are, are crazy animals. Oh, yeah, they're super neat. Um, no, like Lost City of Atlantis or anything no, like that? No, nothing like that. <laughs> At this point, it just seems, yeah, there are really dense aggregations in some areas, but we're still trying to figure out why. Uh, maybe it's like the geography of the area or the currents that may affect it, like getting nutrients and um, marine snow. Can you explain what marine snow is? Marine snow is particles of organic material, so uh, like broken down bits of animals from the surface and phytoplankton from the surface that may fall. And the deep sea corals use this as their food. It's one of the big ways that carbon from the surface is able to get down to the deep sea ecosystem. It literally just sinks, filters down, 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 down down to a thousand feet deep. Uh, But it's uh, one of those foundational parts of the nutrient cycle is stuff just falling down and happened and being caught by deep sea corals. Yeah, it's a big part of why life can exist at the bottom of the ocean. So why why do deep sea corals matter for like fishing stocks? Um, Fishing stocks have been depleted around where we're used to finding fish. People have exploited these resources um, in typical well-known fisheries. And so deep sea fishing has become more of a prospect because fish are known to be found around these corals. 
they can hide there or they can hunt there for things that hide there. So it's likely that fishermen would want to exploit these resources as well. So we'd want to be able to harvest those resources in a more sustainable way, if that's possible. So basically, the coral builds structure and the animals flock to that structure because it provides hiding places for them to not get eaten, but also hiding places for prey that animals want to eat. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So, Presley, Dr. Fullerton mentioned to us in our primary interview that you kind of came along and she was like, okay, do some background research on what you're studying and like find papers on it and whatever. And she said there were like three or something. So how has that experience been doing research on something that really hasn't been looked into that much previously? It can get very frustrating to look out there and not see a lot of information, especially when I don't really know what's happening about the topic, but it's also really exciting to think about what I can discover by the end of summer and with the further research that Dr. Fullerton and Dr. Spalding will be doing, it's exciting to think about all the new information that could be released and then I could be a part of that. Are any of you guys planning on publishing manuscripts based off of what you're doing this summer? Hopefully. (laughs) We've definitely had that conversation with our mentors and uh, like authorship and stuff like that. And everyone here is doing like groundbreaking stuff. And it's really interesting. And fingers crossed that everyone's data like pulls through. And I honestly believe that everyone can push out like a good article out there, a journal. Because that's kind of unheard of. That is Mm -hmm. exceedingly rare to be published as an undergrad. Like that's something that usually graduate students get to do yeah publishing Uh, as an undergrad is like the gold standard like that it's your golden ticket yeah that's fantastic what a great opportunity for all of you guys so getting back to uh, the microbiomes with the algae which i know both of you guys are studying what is kind of the utility of that like yeah it's good to have the basic science and understand what kind of bacteria are associated with different types of algae but why does that matter to joe schmo off the street So the microbiome of algae are important because the microbiome gives the algae most of its nutrients. And so these microbes have environmental purposes, but also industrial purposes. So algae microbiome has been proven to be successful in wastewater treatments. And so if we can uncover the relations between the algae species and morphological features and truly understand which microbes are conducting these industrial processes, we can then uncover how to make algae wastewater treatment a true future tool. Something that's actually viable as a like a cost effective way of providing wastewater treatment for human populations. Exactly. That's definitely a huge up and coming technology. I know that SeaWorld San Antonio just recently put in the first aquarium exhibit that is actually uses biofiltration. So they built a sea turtle exhibit so that members of the public can see the sea turtles, but they also have a wetland that's associated with it that they use for cleaning their nitrogen out of the water. And so this biomimicry process of learning which algae, which bacteria are most effective at removing waste products from the water and cleaning that water up so that it's reusable for other purposes. That's not only really on the cutting edge of science, but it's also on the cutting edge of industry. You know, it's something that there's going to be a lot of money out there because the earth is really good at taking care of like waste products and recycling nutrients. And we have created technologies that sort of do it okay, but cost a lot of money. And so if we can and not reinvent the wheel and just kind of borrow what nature has already provided, that makes a lot more financial sense. And as we're getting to the point where we're starting to say, oh, maybe we shouldn't reinvent the wheel, there's a lot of money and energy being spent on figuring out the best ways to do that. And your research is a big part of that. And that's really freaking cool. Right. In order to make algae wastewater treatment a true process, we first have to understand the microbiome and sequence their genome as well. So... Right. You got to understand everything on the foundational level before you can put it into practice. Exactly. That's really awesome. Yeah. Since y'all are in kind of like the last three weeks here wrapping up in this RAU program, I would love to... I saw a lot of panicked faces when you said that. (laughs) You're like, "Uh, don't remind me. Um, But I would love to go around and just kind of hear your thoughts on what this REU experience has been like and things that you've really taken away from it, things you've really enjoyed, uh, especially for anyone listening that might think like, oh, hey, this would be a really cool thing for me to look at doing. I can start. (laughs) I mean, the program has really connected me with so many people across this country. And that's like one of my favorite things about just 
being in college is that you meet people from all over the place and all over the country and you start getting connections and that's going to be so useful when you start your career. I'm like in your future research career, you might come across like having to work with microbes. And I was like, you know what? I know Presley from working with her that long summer. Let me give her a call. Like it's so great. And coming in here and kind of being nervous, like, am I capable of doing this research? Like, is that something I can do? And coming here and getting the tools and the right support from your mentors and really putting that scientist hat on you for the first time. It's a really like fulfilling role and gives you that kind of validation of like, oh, I am picking the right thing. Or maybe it's also clarity for some people like, oh, maybe I'm supposed to be doing something else. But yeah, um, honestly, coming in here as a first gen student is something that was completely unimaginable for my family. And for anybody listening who's also first gen, like you guys can be in the seat too. Like there's nothing stopping you. Anyone who has said you can't do this, no, you are perfectly capable. And there's a lot of support out there for it, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, you guys, y'all are getting paid to come out here and do this work, right? You get a stipend, you get housing. Like, there's a lot of support out there f- Definitely. For, for students that have the drive and, and really want to want to do something like this. What else have you guys experienced? It doesn't all have to be, like, super inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I get that was wonderful. Don't get me wrong. You just be like, I like the beach. <laughs> <laughs> well... So what Anna said at the end, um, in terms of first gen, like I am also first gen. Um, and so coming into this program was a big deal for me because I knew I needed the financial support and I also knew I needed to learn some skills. Um, what I took away from the program, though, is how to kind of lead myself and feel a lot more comfortable leading myself, feel a lot more comfortable being in a position where I am in control And I know what I have to get done. These are things I have to get done. And I can trust myself. And that is something that has taken a lot of time to get through. I mean, we have three weeks left. I still doubt myself all the time. Um, (laughs) But I feel a lot more comfortable where I am. And honestly, like, the best part of this program is the people here. Like, the girls here around the table. (laughs) It's just, like, for real, it's, it's been really great to be surrounded by people who are so supportive of one another and understanding of one another. I mean, we go out together, we do everything together. And that is something that I feel very blessed to have had, like, mm. for real. <laughs> I know, I know this is like getting really cheesy, but, <laughs> but I mean, it's been really cool. And for someone who has basically almost never seen the ocean before, um, someone who has never been on a boat before, everything has been a completely new experience. And at first it was overwhelming. But it's like meeting the people here and having like Presley for me, when I was with Presley and we went out to the beach and it was the first time I had salt water get into my mouth and I was (laughs) a little freaked out. And she said, no, this is great. Like, I love seeing someone experience something for the first time ever. And I'm so happy to see someone look that happy to do it. So it's the people here really made it for me, I think. Y'all, the feels are getting to me right now. (laughs) good <laughs> <laughs> has, has anybody had like just panic moments this summer of like I, oh my gosh what's happening how do i resolve this how do i fix this oh my gosh yeah <laughs> we had a poster session and it was probably oh. the most stressful part of the program so far it felt like a lot more pressure than it probably should have for us but it was making a poster that should be as professional as possible as clean as possible as understandable as possible and being able to present it in a way that everybody understood it, as well as being able to respond to questions on your project that you've really only been working on for two weeks. Like, that was... That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Exciting. But you got through it. Yeah, we did. It was all. It was great for all of us. And now the next time you do a poster session, you're going to have something to rely on and yeah. like go back and be like, even if I could get through that, then I can get through this one. Basically. Yeah. Anybody else? Like, just terror moments like oh my gosh i can't believe that happened i lost a boot in pluff mud (laughs) (laughs) yeah Um, i think everyone's gotten a pluff mud story this summer yeah a little bit of everything that was the first time i was in mud my foot flew out and then went into the mud as well and i've never had a muddy sock before (laughs) um and i never want to have to happen again it was horrible for people who are not in the south carolina area can you tell us what pluff mud is 
I cannot tell you. She, they can tell you. <laughs> so, fluff mud is a little smelly, and it's also kind of like the more aggressive version of like quicksand to me. It's just mud, and you don't. You think you can walk on it, like oh, that's fine. And you 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 step on it, and you just start sinking immediately. And it just like feels two like feet. yeah, like up to your knees. Like, it's like pretty bad, and it's just like feet of mud so there's nothing underneath you that's like hard or anything and it like kind of suction cups you too into the (laughs) the ground so you're just like i don't know how to get out of here suddenly your worst nightmare is coming true you're like i'm gonna die here now (laughs) (laughs) like in the middle of a tidal marsh in south carolina (laughs) and the worst part is the oysters the oysters Uh. surround like surrounding you yeah because like i lost my footing when my foot fell into the mud and i was freaking out that my sock was muddy i also lost my balance and my like I caught myself my hand caught yeah. me on some oysters thank god I didn't get cut I just got a little scrape but it's like your life flashes before you and they're no joke like those oysters <laughs> yeah, no. they're like hidden yeah. inside the mud and so like you're sinking and then all of a sudden it's just like razors on your leg yeah we have an oyster count in the intern house of everyone <laughs> who's gotten an oh my gosh. Cut. we have like up to 10 I think <laughs> In addition to oyster counts, we have a broken bone count (laughs) (laughs) because I broke my finger. (laughs) Yeah, we were out kayaking on um, Grice Beach and I was carrying a kayak that I should not have been carrying because it was really heavy. And on the way down, it took my finger with it. (laughs) Good. Well, I feel like I'm in good company now with my broken ankle. (laughs) You can add me to the checklist. Okay. (laughs) Kayaking accident, skateboarding accident. Yeah. These are pretty cool ways to break bones. Yeah. Fair. So before we go, Presley, do you have any recommendations for anyone looking to get into this REU program or maybe a different REU program on things they should consider when choosing a program or things they should do ahead of time while applying? So things to do ahead of time is definitely work with a professor at your university or whatever kind of education you're at and do a research project with them because I know that's what really helped me get skills and what helped me get into this program is coming in with a defined set of skills already that I I learned from my mentor at my home institution. And Things to look for when applying or searching for an REU program. Just be open to anything. When I was looking at this program, I saw marine biology, and I'm more interested in environmental science. So when I saw marine, at first I thought, oh, that won't relate to me. But then I read the projects, and I thought this is actually really interesting, and I could really get into this. So you may look at something and think that you won't be interested in it, but give it a chance, and you might find out you really love it. Because there's hundreds of these RU programs across the country, and they they all have different stuff going on, but there's a lot of very diverse opportunities out there. So it's definitely worth it to put the time in to search, and it's definitely worth it to not throw things out just because it doesn't fit your pre-existing mold of what you thought you wanted to do. Exactly. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. We really appreciate your time again, and I hope you have a great rest of your summer here. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conservation Connection. If you enjoyed our podcast, go ahead and subscribe to make sure you catch every episode that we post. We would love to hear from you. So if you want to reach out, go to our website, lastchanceendeavors.com backslash contact and shoot us an email. We love questions from our listeners. So if you heard something that you want to know more about, be sure to let us know. We'll post bonus content that addresses your questions and gives you a little more information. A big thanks to Grice Marine Lab for hosting us and a big thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to tune in next week.